I welcome all of our listeners around the world. And I also learned that we even have some listeners from Australia. And that means it's mighty early for them. So that's wonderful. We really appreciate your interest in that. So this is the second of our search series. And the series is called Committing Ourselves to Social Justice, Doctoral Education in Complex Times. And boy, are the times complex. I'm one of the hosts. I'm Marie Ginera. I was a professor of higher education at the University of Washington and director of Center for Innovation and Research in Higher Education. And I'm very happy that we have, that Berkeley this time is hosting this event. And I must want to introduce with you to you our other five hosts. And one is George Blumenthal, who is the director of the Center for Studies in Higher Education at the University of California, Berkeley. George is by training an astrophysicist, and he was the former chancellor of the University of California in Santa Cruz. When I told George about a year ago about this series, search series, he immediately and enthusiastically agreed to host the second one. And so later then George, if he comes on, he will um, introduce the speakers for today's event. Now our second host, and I hope we have her, we can see her is Margaret Heisel. Is she here with us? <laughs> yes. Hi, Marisi. That's wonderful. Margaret is a senior research associate, also in the center, and she was very initiative and in also helping to put this together and find just the right speakers. And then we have three more hosts who help us very much with the technical part. Maybe we can see them. One is Helen Prehartz. Do we see her? Not really. Yes. And Gemma, she and both Helen are doing a lot of the technical part, including our fifth host, Roxana Chiappa. And he, she really was a key spirit behind this initiating this series when she was still at the University of California, Berkeley. Now she is a lecturer at Rhodes University in South Africa. So Roxana, why don't you say something about, or maybe I we have first George, if he's here, yes, yes, to introduce our two speakers. And maybe before he does that, I will say something for those who are new to the series, a bit about the background, why we chose such uh, a topic. And this was in order to make visible really the role of doctoral education in questioning systems of exclusion and inequality. We here at the Center for Innovation Research in Graduate Education decided to invite scholars across the world to participate in this webinar. Our aim is to provide doctoral students, instructors, departments, graduate deans, vice chancellor for research, and funders for doctoral education to provide a better understanding of the structures, the practices, and the pedagogy that would need to be addressed in different disciplines and organizations to be more inclusive, embrace diversity and equity in the educational outcomes at the doctoral level. We acknowledge from the very beginning that social justice is tied to specific political and cultural context. So rather than starting as we academic tend to do sometimes to with a specific definition, this series wanted to investigate 
what social justice could look like and means in various academic disciplines and communities around the world. And so today we move to the Berkeley campus and Roxana will us remind a bit about the very current situation why such a topic and a webinar is quite important. Yeah, yes, just a reflection. Um, before, when we started the idea of this series, and I was still a doctoral student at the University of Washington in Seattle, we always discuss that doctoral programs are preparing the new generation of scholars, of intellectual leaders for unpredictable futures. And why social justice, right? Why in this unpredictable future, social justice is so fundamental? And the unpredictable future that we are, we were preparing is actually our current present. Nobody anticipated this pandemic. And in crisis, the inequality at all levels gets bigger. And I think it's, it's very relevant that we are having this conversation today, embracing the complexity and situating justice at the center of the conversation. How does it look like to address that conversation in these times at the doctorate level? So just a thought to keep in mind. And I'm super excited for the speakers that we have today because in their, in their practice, in the daily um, operation, how they embrace these notions. Right. Just a note, this event will be also available on Zoom and a, a videotape, a transcript, both on the Center for Studies in Higher Education Berkeley website, as well as on the SEARCH website. We call our center search. And Gemma, you may say a bit how participants can, can the audience can participate in there. Would you mind saying a word? Hi, everybody. Um, so we're about 75 people on right now, and everyone is currently muted with the option to unmute. But we ask throughout the presentation that you stay muted to cut back on any background noise and if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to write them in our Zoom group chat here. And at the end of our presentations, Roxana and I will go through them and read them back to the speaker on your behalf. Thank you. And now I invite George to welcome our two special speakers for today. Thank you so much, Maurice. And before I do that, I really want to thank you for organizing what I think is going to prove to be an outstanding presentation and, and, and hopefully a very thought provoking discussion. So thank you for doing that. Uh, the Center for Studies in Higher Education is delighted to uh, host this. And we're particularly delighted to have our two speakers today uh, join us. One is Dr. Colette Pat, the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and the Director of Diversity Programs in Mathematical and Physical Sciences at UC Berkeley. And she's here with us today, along with Dr. Khalid Kadir, who's a lecturer in the College of Engineering, and he's the recipient of the 2017 Distinguished Teaching Award at UC Berkeley, which is a significant honor and for, for faculty members to receive. So welcome to both of you. So we welcome, I put so you can see me again. And now we would welcome very much um, Margaret to uh, begin and um, then welcome both um, Khalid who will start and then with uh, Colette. And then Margaret will be our discussion leader and may pose question and you may pose question and both our speakers are here to answer. Margaret. <laughs> thank you, Marisi. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Colette and Khalid for joining us today to speak about this very important issue. Uh, did you want me to go ahead and mention the article, Marisi? Um, yeah, maybe go ahead and mention the article and then they will talk about it and Let give a summary to it. Let me just say that uh, in the course of identifying speakers and investigating this subject, uh, one of the articles that I took as a kind of 
framing of the issue was by Professor Aaron Check at Rice University. And what she does in this article, which is entitled The Misframing of Social Justice, Why Ideologies of Depoliticization and Meritocracy Hinder Engineers' Ability to Think About Social Injustices. And I found that it was a very a good capsule discussion. What she does is look at engineering education and analyze the degree to which social justice figures in uh, the development of uh, a student's identification as an engineer, understanding of engine, the professional culture. And she, as a result of that, she points out depoliticization and meritocracy as being two fundamental principles uh, of engineering, both of which tend to have a somewhat negative effect on consciousness of social justice. Depoliticization, because uh, it refers to the fact that science and math are the two fundamental principles uh, of engineering, and both are objective, and therefore, uh, as she sees it, unrelated to political and social issues, and meritocracy being the belief that individual success in life is earned through talent and education and motivation, not taking into consideration the fact that uh, it that social in inequities have such a huge influence on students' success. Uh, and she indicates that in order to advance this, we need to, in order to advance the recognition of social justice, in engineering education, we need to deconstruct those two principles by illustrating that practice of engineering does have social and political consequences. Think about putting big highways through uh, neighborhoods kind of thing. <coughs> and meritocracy as a principle is based upon the idea that uh, at the beginning of our lives, all individuals have the same opportunities available to them for success, which, as we all know, is not true. Uh, so I recommend this article. And she also stresses that recognition of these two of these facts need to be integrated into engineering education. And for that, we will turn to Khalid, who has been a real exemplar of how that can be done. We're very proud of him here at Berkeley. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Roxana, I think I'm unable to share my screen. Are we, can we get the, maybe make us co-host if that's a thing. Uh, here we go, thank you. Um, thanks all, uh, super excited to be here. Um, despite the, the sort of sort of confusion all around us in the world right now. Um, I think this is a particularly important conversation. And and Margaret, I appreciate how you brought uh, brought Aaron Check's work into this. Um, and I'm going to build off of that when I, in, in what I want to talk about today. Um, so just a quick outline of what I want to cover. I want to talk about an example of a course that I teach, uh, sample size of one. So let's keep that in mind. Um, and that's an undergraduate course uh, meant specifically, designed specifically to bring some social justice into engineering education. Um, and then some reflections on how this might look at the doctoral level. Um, so a little bit about that course so that perhaps it'll make sense how it came to be and what it's about. Um, there were a number of things we wanted to achieve. The course was not the only sort of way in which we were trying to go about achieving that, but um, there were a number of, of uh, specific goals we had when we created this. The first is that we wanted to to provide a way for engineering students to have a much more sophisticated uh, engagement with ethics. Um, 
it's I, I I try not to be flippant about it, but there's just the there are a number of memes out there about the the sort of silliness of most engineering ethics courses. Maybe that does enough to tell us um, that students generally or commonly find that the sort of one credit pass no pass ethics class that they have to take to meet the accreditation standards isn't really uh, delivering much in, in terms of sort of rigorous engagement with what it means to be an ethical person coming out of a, a undergraduate program as an engineer. So we wanted to improve that. Um, we also wanted for a pathway for students to get involved in issues related to social justice, but a pathway for them to do it as engineers from within engineering. Here on the Berkeley campus, there are so many ways for, for students to, to get involved in things. We have a bit of a reputation for that, but we wanted a way for students to do it as part of their engineering identities. Um, we also created this because we we're looking for ways to recruit and retain underrepresented students. Uh, the College of Engineering has a bit of a, a, a serious challenge in recruiting and, and retaining students from underrepresented backgrounds in the College of Engineering. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, and, and not simply underrepresented minorities, but also women, just as, a, as a, another single data point, I think in electrical engineering and computer science, the percentage of female in the program is somewhere around 13%. So you can see that this is sort of heavily skewed towards males. Um, and so they were looking for ways to, to bring forth the program that speaks to the concerns of underrepresented minorities and women and speaks to how the work of engineers does or doesn't show up in their lives and in their communities. Um, and and finally, related to that, uh, part of the goal was also to address campus climate issues that were happening in the College of Engineering. And, and that was to be done through making explicit the social structures in which we're operating with the hope and expectation that making those social structures explicit will give us a bit of a common language through which we can better address some of these issues. So with those sort of goals in mind, um, I was tasked to, to design this course. I had a number of thought partners in the process, which I was very grateful to. But to, to make, and this is in spring of 2014 was the first year, um, to make sense of this, though, I think it's important to note that it is what we call an ACES course, an American Cultures Engaged Scholarship course. On the Berkeley campus, every undergraduate has to take what we call an AC course, an American Cultures course, before graduating. And an AC course requires students to deal with multiple racial categories in a comparative manner. This requirement, which was created by the Academic Senate, came out of the Third World Liberation Front and the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and this sort of stamped on our curriculum that you can't graduate from Berkeley unless you've taken a class that helps you understand race in a comparative manner. So we, we wanted to make this course uh, a part of that requirement, both for logistical reasons, but also because bringing the conversation of race directly into engineering was something that had not been done on our campus before. Um, and the course is fundamentally a bridge between environmental engineering and social justice through an environmental justice framework. We talk about drinking water, stormwater, wastewater, air pollution, infrastructure, waste disposal, and we talk about all these things through a justice-based framework. Uh, who's it benefiting? Who's it harming? How did it get to be this way? Um, and we, in the course, we have a number of community partners. So one of the goals, and this is why it's an ACES, not just an AC class, um, half of the students in the course complete projects with various community partners. They get an extra unit of credit and they spend much of the semester working on projects that have been co-designed by the teaching team and by the community partners. Um, and these are projects that help engineers see how, they all have to be sort of technically connected projects or engineering connected projects. And the goal is to help engineers see how their work is deeply connected to issues of inequality and how the work of engineers is deeply socially and politically embedded. And that it's, it's to, to help them understand in sort of an experiential way that you can't do engineering work in a vacuum, that your work is affecting people differentially, and, and it's important to understand the sort of differential social structures in society in order to understand how that work lands in the world. Um, so the course has been pretty successful, I would say. It's now, I guess now I'm in my, this is my sixth year teaching it. It's taught once a semester. Um, and it's particularly been successful for some of the reasons that we started it. And I've underlined in red the sort of two sort of interesting 
so there's numbers that I want to, you want to draw attention to. Um, in the College of Engineering, we have about 28% female, and in the class, we're about half. Um, and in the College of Engineering, we have about 6% underrepresented minorities, and 20% of students in this course are underrepresented minorities. So we're disproportionately attracting women and folks of color into this, and I think it's gained a bit of a, a repetition reputation for speaking to the concerns that these students have and for making them uh, making it possible for many of these students to see new ways in which engineering is connected to their own life histories and not something that that requires them to leave behind their own history and to, to take on a, a brand new identity. Um, it has about 60 students uh, in the course every year, um, but there's an application to get into the course and over two 200 people apply every every year. Um, and I think that speaks to coming from the students, there is a huge demand for this. There's a deep desire to engage with this kind of material, um, which I don't think we've really been meeting very well. Administratively, uh, when we first started the project, there was an enormous amount of resistance. Uh, a lot of statements like this is not engineering was a phrase that we heard more than once. Now the tables have turned and there's a widespread recognition of not only the success of the course uh, and the great importance of the material that the course covers, but even, a, and there's a lot of discussions happening right now about an effort to expand and, and all offer more of this sort of material to engineering undergraduates. Um, the biggest challenge, which I'll get to later, is the professoriate. Like, who's going to teach this? And and uh, myself, I'm a, a lecturer, I'm in, which is a contingent faculty member. Um, it doesn't provide the kinds of uh, academic freedom that someone with tenure has. And when you're dealing with these this material, it's tricky. You know, walking into a classroom full of engineers and talking about race, where a lot of students are, are arguing there's no such thing. Um, that becomes, you know, at times contentious. Uh, there are still those who don't believe this belongs in STEM. They think keep this in sociology, keep this in in other disciplines. But I think there are others that that are that are recognizing that we as engineers can't just let someone else or some other department or discipline carry the weight of our social responsibility. We can't pretend like we're not. We we can ignore this stuff. So that's that's an undergraduate course and and. And I'm happy to share more about that course anytime. I, I you know, love talking about it. It's been a highlight for me. But I want to think about how might this sort of work show up in doctoral education. Um, given my teaching of this course, um, I found that that doctoral students are constantly coming through my uh, my inbox, basically asking me about where does this stuff show up in the College of Engineering. Students who have applied to our school are reaching out to me to say you know, I'm interested in this material, where can I do it? And I'm in this awkward position of like, well, I'm a lecturer, I teach a bunch of classes, I'm not going to be your research advisor, but you can take this undergraduate level course. So these questions are constantly being raised. Um, and I think that the first thing when we think about STEM doctoral education, for me, from my vantage point, is that we have to think about the curriculum. And of course, this has to happen at the doctoral level, but I think it has to start before that. Um, as a as uh, Margaret pointed out, that Czech found that students moving through engineering programs, um, or actually this is a separate paper of Erin Czech's, uh, she found that students moving through engineering programs in the US come out less interested in addressing matters of public concern than they were when they entered. So they come through our programs and they end up caring less about issues of public concern and are much more focused on their own individual advancement. We're literally training concern for others out of engineers in the way that we teach them. Um, and, and just another sort of anecdotal point is I have a really hard time finding graduate student instructors from within engineering to teach with me. Um, they simply just don't know the material. It's foreign material to them and increasingly doctoral students are enrolling to take the class uh, because they want to learn the material. Um, so with that in mind, I want to sort of sort of approach the question of how do we how do we solve this? What exactly do I mean when when I, I say that this needs to end up in the curriculum? Well, I think we need to look no further than Erin Ketch's work. Um, and she gives us a clear map of issues we need to address in our curriculum. Uh, and the first of that uh, is depoliticization, this belief that our work can and should be disconnected from social and political concerns. Uh, because it might bias our otherwise supposedly objective professional practice. Um, and I think the solution to this is perhaps obvious. We have to make politics a central part of our STEM work. 
Um, in our research questions in particular, we can start to engage with what are the politics at play in the questions we ask? What are we asking? What aren't we asking? Who is doing the asking? Um, we can think about what, what are the politics embedded in our research methods, uh, i.e. what are the standards that we have for making truth claims and what is left out or, or what is denied and who then is left out and who is silenced in the process of requiring certain methods and rejecting other methods. And finally, the, the most obvious sort of political economic question is where does our funding come from? Um, so what is and isn't getting funding and what does that tell us about the political nature of our work and who is structurally designed to benefit from our work? Um, Ketch also brings up this concern about a social technical dualism that exists within engineering and that social competencies are considered not real engineering or real science. This is that hard soft uh, dichotomy that's often put forth. Um, yet everything we do is social. Uh, we have a, a, a crisis of facts versus alternative facts right now in the US precisely because we as scientists have not only neglected but often outright denied the social nature of our work. Peer review, it's a fundamentally social process for how we come to assert truths. Um, among many today, science just lacks credibility. And this is an issue, again, it's not unique to engineering. A number of scholars are interested in higher education and in education more broadly have noted the increasing instrumentalization of education, uh, the push to treat education as a process of learning a set of concrete skills, as opposed to treating education as a process of cultivating critical thinkers and engaged community members. And here, the solution, is, I think, is that we have to require a deep liberal arts training for scientists and engineers. And this is probably the most difficult solution that I'm putting forward because it requires really a deep dive into the curriculum about what the required courses are. What, what are those liberal arts? Well, Wendy, and, and I, I'm addressing this because I find that often in engineering circles, the sense of what does liberal arts even mean is, is, is lost. Um, Wendy Brown refers to liberal arts as the knowledge that enabled the use of freedom. And I find that a really powerful way of understanding what they are, the knowledge that enabled the use of freedom. We're talking about grammar, dialectic, ways of investigating the truth of opinions, rhetoric, geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, music, history, theology. Uh, we need to know these in order to exercise our freedoms and to not be a slave to ignorance. And I think that, that this is really important for, for doctoral students in STEM to have a deep appreciation and understanding for these liberal arts. And the final one that again, Margaret brought up is this mythical meritocratic ideology that is an enduring myth among uh, scientists, scientists and engineers. It's a myth that comes with a little bit of ugliness. Uh, it's profoundly self-serving when it's put forward by those who have been granted success by the status quo. And I think the solution here uh, is to train engineers and scientists to understand the relationality of marginalization and oppression. Social scientists do this really regularly. They spend a lot of time thinking about how wealth and poverty are actually part of the same system. We may not just study why are people poor or hungry or sick, but we're gonna understand why are some people well-fed, wealthy and healthy, and how are these two related to one another? And I think helping engineers and scientists understand that they live in relational systems, and that might go a long way to helping them get get over the sort of meritocratic myths and they can understand their role in these relational systems. Now, these approaches to STEM that I'm proposing, finding good, maybe you like them, maybe you don't, but I think it's important to note that fundamentally what I'm proposing here is, is not a small undertaking. I'm arguing that if we want to try to embrace social justice and STEM education, it's gonna require us to consider making a deep epistemological transformation. Um, it requires us to value other forms of knowing and other forms of knowledge production outside of the positivist, quantitative, and empirical, the methods that dominate the work of STEM disciplines today. But this isn't simply an epistemological transformation. It has deep practical implications. Uh, I think it will lead to us asking new and different research questions. It will lead to us making deep changes in our curriculum adding new courses, changing the way we teach our current courses. Uh, it'll lead to us changing the how and where we do our work. 
and who we work for, who we are accountable to in our work, and it will change who we work with, who literally we invite into our programs and the, and the kinds of disciplinary and identities that, that will show up in our programs. Um, and in all of this, what I'm hoping is that we can reframe what it means to be a scientist or engineer. And we can start to, to cultivate critical STEM practitioners uh, that recognize the limits of their own professional expertise, that recognize the limits of their technicality. I often say we will train STEM scholars who learn to stay in their lane that understand where their expertise are and understand the limits of those. Um, we can then, then also recognize that doing sort of engineering for good or science for good is very limited. Well, intentions are great, but they don't necessarily land in the world in a justice-based way. And, and having engineers and scientists scientists who routinely render their work political, and this is building off the work of Tanya Lee, who, uh, who talks about the ways in which engineers and technical workers render things technical, and instead we might render things political, and thinking about how we redraw our, our systems diagrams or control volumes to bring power, history, context into the frame, and expand the sorts of solutions that are possible. Um, I think this also involves having us as STEM practitioners uh, reimagining our identities and remembering that we are not simply scientists, engineers, or academics. We're not simply technical people. Um, and I think sometimes we don't embrace this. This is particular for engineers that, oh, call the engineer. And it's usually a he, right? And we have political positions in relation to the projects that we do. And in, we are politically related to the communities we work with. And the identity of an academic doesn't capture all that we are. We're neighbors, we might be voters, we might be parents, we're consumers. Uh, the key point is that we're not outsiders, but we're actually related in complicated ways to the work that we're doing. And we have to understand, we have to start to, to recognize our position of, of connection to our work, recognizing the, that the personal is political. And I think that also helps us realize that we have more to offer than simply our technical expertise. And finally, um, and perhaps the, the most challenging of all of these, given the nature of academic work today, is I think we might start thinking about how we can cultivate long-term sustained engagement with marginalized communities. And as opposed to the sort of narrow technical engagements where we drop in, do some technical scientific work and leave, how might we think about making deep, deep Deep connections with the people that are affected by this work and and engage in sort of a long term uh, uh, connection to them. And this is partly stemming from the belief that social justice concerns issues of social justice. They're not discrete problems that we can walk in solve and leave. Uh, they require a broader conception of our professional practice and they require a broader framing of what it means to be a researcher or an academic. So before I leave, I just want to note that I, I haven't covered everything. I tried to be quick and cover some of the most salient points. Um, what I have covered is what is being taught, the curriculum, and our approach to knowledge production in STEM. But what I've left out of this is who is doing the cheap teaching and questions about how we might go about changing the professoriate. Um, and I've also left out the question of under what conditions are they teaching? Is teaching even valued or is research the ultimate driver? I think about schools like, like UC Berkeley, teaching is, is a fourth priority after publishing, more publishing and more publishing. Um, I think I, I bring that up because I think we have to think about our own institutions and not just how we engage engage with issues of social concern that are out there somewhere off campus, but the very real social injustices upon which our own work is built. What do I mean by that? I mean the underpaid labor of graduate students who at my own institution are on strike right now fighting for a living wage, for adjunct faculty who lack any meaningful academic freedom, for service workers who keep the university and laboratories running and clean, for the librarians who help us in our process of knowledge production. These are, are the people that keep our universities running. There's an excellent book uh, by by um, Dr. Connell out of Australia called The Good University that just came out this year, really unpacks the, the deep sort of collaborative process of teaching and research at, in higher education. And it recognizes and it brings forth the ways in which teaching and research are collective processes. And I think we must seriously consider our treatment of those who are part of this process, even if they're often rendered invisible. If we're serious about social justice and STEM, I think we have to consider how we might clean up our own houses first. 
So with that, uh, I will leave you and I think we're passing it to Colette next. Hi, hi everybody. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, okay, is that up everybody? Can everybody see that? Great. Um, I'm going to segue from um, what Khalid discussed, um, and he raised the issue of how in the STEM fields might um, the STEM community uh, create sustained engagement with marginalized communities. And that's a, a really um, just a direct segue to the processes that I'm uh, going to discuss today. And so hopefully, um, as Khalid has spoken about the, some of the content and pedagogy and the focus of engineering education, you'll see we're shifting um, in this talk to who does science, who gets access to science, who reaps the rewards of scientific careers, and what that might have to do with sustained engagement uh, with marginalized communities, as uh, Khalid, I think, so aptly put it. I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing at Berkeley and with our colleagues at other uh, California institutions and institutions around the country more recently to try to promote equality and inclusion in graduate education at research universities in the United States and what kinds of um, insights we're gaining into the kinds of structures and practices that are required to get to uh, more equitable distribution of opportunities at the postdoctoral and faculty level for career advancement. Um, my focus will be, however, at the graduate level and, and uh, um, how the graduate level, how, how we transition from the graduate level to the postdoc and faculty level more equitably. So I want to start by saying that um, we often think about who does science in terms of the health of the scientific community, and that's really important. Um, who does science also is um, inherently a matter of justice and fairness. Um, are, are all sectors of our population, all demographic groups, well represented in the scientific community? And in the United States, um, that is not the case, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But basically, I wanted to start by just sort of framing why it's really important to have, um, to concentrate on these issues of um, who does science. Basically, research universities um, in the United States produce most of the scientific research workforce in federally funded research centers, industry, government. Um, the kinds of careers that lead from STEM degrees are some of the most lucrative um, in society. So there's a question of social justice there, Who's, who is, has access to these incredibly lucrative careers that then um, bring money back into which kinds of communities in our, in our country. Um, at large universities, the culture of universities is um, heavily influenced by the science, technology, engineering, and math faculty who typically constitute roughly 50% of the faculty. And that's true, for example, at the University of California throughout its 10 campus system, which is the major research university system um, in California, a very large state. Um, and then uh, research universities themselves play a particular role. So who has access to the postdoc and faculty level, the graduate level at research universities is very important. Research universities and particularly top research universities disproportionately prepare the entire professoriate of the United States. So these institutions at every level have kind of an exponential impact. They're producing the faculty who then educate students, et cetera. And um, that I think uh, circles back a little bit to some of the issues Khalid just raised. We have a very serious and ongoing problem in the United States. And I want to say these problems have been the problems of underrepresentation of um, what we consider underrepresented minorities in the STEM fields. Um, African Americans, Hispanics, Chicanx, Latinx community folks, um, indigenous people, um, and also women and people with disabilities, but I'm focusing particularly today on um, minoritized racial groups in the United States, but 
these issues of underrepresentation are uh, have persevered for as far back as we can look to the 1970s, particularly at the graduate and postdoc level. Um, the problem is particularly acute in the mathematical, physical sciences and engineering, environmental sciences, these fields. Um, and this is despite a huge influx, uh, annual influx of funding to try to address these questions. So we see that at the, um, at the graduate level, we see very sort of a glacial pace of change from in you know, the last 20 years, basically 5% of our PhDs have been PhDs from underrepresented minority groups. And over the past 20 years, that's increased to 10%. So doubling, but doubling is pretty trivial at that level in some sense. Um, <clears throat> and at the um, postdoc and, and faculty level, the, um, the share of um, the share of those positions that underrepresented minorities have is extremely small and does has not kept pace with even the increases at the graduate level. Um, this is particularly alarming because over the same period of time, the absolute number of postdoctoral positions and faculty positions has substantially increased. And so we've missed a, lar a, a, a really open window to diversify our faculty and that process is um, continuing. So I'm going to show you some of these st statistics visually just very quickly. About a third of our US population is underrepresented minority and rapidly increasing uh, to soon become the majority. Um, the, we see this drop off. So the BA recipients in the, in the STEM fields that drop off is to 20%. We then see that have again at the PhD level. So roughly 10% to roughly 10% in these particular fields. And then we see a further drop off at the postdoc and faculty level. And what you'll notice is that the postdoc and the faculty level track almost precisely with each other. And that, um, that so, and that's concerning. Why do we care about this the, the fact that we're missing most of our um, population of underrepresented um, potential scientists on the faculty. Well, first of all, it's a question of justice and, and, and economic fairness and, and educational fairness, as I discussed a little bit earlier. But also the faculty put, play, play a very significant role. They influence um, the graduate students, they influence the undergraduates, they, are, they influence the postdocs, they are, they are the uh, level at which selection is made for entry into each of those other levels. They are the role models, the guides, the mentors, the advisors, the facilitators of um, advancement at each of those levels. So the faculty play a really crucial role and um, this is why we emphasize the diversification, the importance of diversifying the faculty. Focusing in today at the graduate level, the, the role of graduate students and doctoral students is really important. Doctoral students tend to be the direct mentors to undergraduates, the direct role models. They are the teaching assistants and graduate student assistants who, who teach courses and conduct re research directly, engaging with undergraduates at most research universities. And they also are the pool of um, the available pool for people to move on to the postdoctoral faculty level. So if the numbers at the, uh, at the graduate level are suppressed, then it's not surprising we see that suppression continue. Although um, one thing we're focused on and particularly concerned about is the disproportionate um, you know, um, drop off again at the postdoc and faculty level. So in our research, what we've asked, the kinds of questions we've asked is what accounts for the persistence of this inequitable progress from the doctoral to the postdoctoral level, the why are we not seeing a smoother transition, a more equitable transition, and what can we do to address this, and how can we um, start to address this more rapidly than we have in the past, because stagnation in this area really is not just stagnation, which is bad enough, it's actually increasing loss as the demographics of the country change. Um, some of the, the issues that have been raised by other researchers and that we look at and have looked at in, in our research are issues about differential preparation going into the graduate level, um, how people feel or don't feel a sense of belonging in graduate programs, whether their advising and mentoring is equitable, fair, and consistent um, with what their peers are receiving, 
Are they experiencing or being subjected to some kind of bias or discrimination? Um, is there other exclusionary practices going on, either intentional or unintentional, perhaps by peers, as well as others in the um, research university environment? And, how, and do finances play a role in this? What about financial security? Does that have an issue, have something to do with this? So we, people have looked at all of these questions and these are, and others, and these are some of the questions that focus, we focus on in our work as well. To try to understand this and get underneath these problems, um, we, we uh, a few years ago did a survey at um, UC Berkeley, specifically in the math, physical sciences, and um, electrical engineering, computer science fields, also chemical science fields. Um, we surveyed our graduate students, asked about a wide range of experiences, and we're trying to understand which of these issues are most salient and how we could best address them. We had reasonable participation rates. Um, in our institution and in general, I think in this area, there's a lot of survey fatigue. It's very difficult to actually get people to re respond. So we felt pretty good about, even though of course we would have liked the response rates to be higher, we felt pretty good about getting at least uh, the levels that we did. Um, to just describe a little bit about the population that we were, that is in the sample. We found that, um, in fact, the financial issues were not a driver here. Most of, um, we had a higher representation of students on fellowships or grants who were from underrepresented groups than we did um, non-minority men. Um, we didn't see issues, the students did not report issues around finances that were, um, where we saw, diff where we could see differences uh, between groups. And then um, this is an important, important slide in the sense that it shows that within the sample, the underrepresented minorities and, and women students were, uh, had passed their qualifying exams at a higher rate, meaning that really our sample disproportionately represents students who are from underrepresented groups who are further along in their academic careers. That's basically how we understand this. So eventually people pass their qualifying exams by and large at Berkeley, there, we don't see big differences there, but this means that the sample population is a little further along. And that's why this particular out result was so alarming to us. So, or for many reasons, but that is one of them. And so, as you can see here, what we, we asked about, uh, we asked broadly about teaching, mentoring, all sorts of things. One of the questions we asked was publication, and we were particularly concerned about publication because Publication is really the gold standard requirement for access to an academic career. Um, you know, we, we sometimes say, and I, I think this is not entirely true, but there's a grain of truth to it. And I think um, Khalid also ref referenced this a little bit, that the three things you need to get an academic job, a faculty, a tenure track job, and publications, publications, and publications. So if we see that, you know, our students, um, our underrepresented minority students are not publishing, not submitting papers for publication, not publishing at the rate of our non-minority students, that's a real cause for alarm as a sign about what their likely prospects are entering the academic job market. We wanted to understand this better, and so we disaggregated by field, anticipating that there might be some field differences or just wondering if there were. Actually, we, we, we tried to disaggregate along every line we could think about, but this is one that came up and was important. Um, so those, that last bar chart that I just uh, showed is here represented as in this other um, format. Um, where you see the underrepresented minorities less likely to have submitted for publication. That's the red dot. The, uh, the open dot is women and the, um, the, the filled in dot is non-minority um, men. When we disaggregate this by field, we see that in the mathematical, physical science, electrical, engineering, computer science, that uh, variation, that variance is far greater, that difference is far greater. But here's what really kind of stunned us and took our breath away and made us think hard about where to go next with this work. In chemistry, those dots more or less line up. And what that means is that these outcomes that we're seeing in the other fields are not, we're, we're seeing equitable outcomes 
and we appear to be seeing equitable outcomes in chemistry. And so that begs the question, what is going on in chemistry? But um, because we're a research group made up primarily of scientists, I'm a social scientist, but the, and there are some psychologists on our team, but by and large, they're scientists. We had, um, you know, we felt very strongly that we needed to really query these results and make sure that what we were seeing was, um, was not a one-time kind of snapshot or uh, in any other way. We just need to be sure that we were triangulating. So we went to, the institution has, um, conducts an exit survey with all uh, students graduating with their PhD. And we went to that exit survey, looked back over the 15 year, most recent 15 years of available data at that time. <clears throat> this is a very robust survey. It has a 98% participation rate. So we don't have issues of, um, you know, uh, survey bias in that sense. Every single student who graduates with a PhD in Berkeley is required to complete the survey. We, on this survey, we found two questions that looked similar to the kinds of questions we had asked on our survey. And I'm going to focus on the first one. The answers to both were quite similar, uh, or the results for both were quite similar, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you the data for one. And that survey was, did you deliver any papers at national scholarly meetings? I want to emphasize here that in some fields, and perhaps even in all fields, uh, how, whether students go and present their papers publicly is um, an indication of whether they're getting visibility as scientists within their scientific community, how they're being promoted and advanced by their mentors and their advisors, um, whether how engaged they are in sort of promoting their own work and, um, and, and sort of uh, pr advance, promoting themselves to advance to the next level. So here, what we see is, again, we see this disparate outcome with um, underrepresented minorities, less likely to have presented at scholarly meetings, um, some, some variation for women. And when we start to break it down and disaggregate by field, we see that that is amplified, that effect is amplified at the, in the mathematical and physical sciences. It's interestingly less so in uh, electrical engineering computer science for presentation at scholarly meetings, even though we did see this effect in paper publication and we're still trying to unpack that. But here again, we see that chemistry is, is an outlier here, really stands out. Those dots line up suggesting equitable um, access to scholarly meetings and advancement in that way. If we disaggregate further by field, so biology wasn't in any of, I haven't shown any biology uh, data before, but you can see that this effect is, it's more common that we have these um, inequitable outcomes than it is than what we see in chemistry. It's more common to have inequitable outcomes across fields. There you see physics, particularly math. So, you know, as we disaggregate further by specific disciplines, we see this effect. Um, we wanted to understand what's happening in chemistry at Berkeley. Why are we seeing this effect? And so I'm not actually going to be able to go in detail into any of the papers that we published, but I just wanted to flash them up there so that you know if you would like to um, read more deeply into the study or see more of our data, you can. They're all published. We publish um, um, in a way that in, in PLOS 1, so you can actually get your hands directly into the data if you'd like to. Um, we, we then went on to do a study with our partners in the California Alliance for Graduate Education, the Professoriate, a National Science Foundation funded program to advance underrepresented minorities in the STEM fields. And I'm really not going to be able to say, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to tell you much about the study. So I'm just going to show you the results. But if you'd like to see the, um, the, the study in more detail, the paper is available, it's published. Um, this was a cross-institutional study, uh, included Berkeley, Caltech, Stanford, and UCLA. We were able to, because it was cross-institutional, we had a larger N with bigger population, bigger sample. Um, we were able to hone in on this question of publication and, um, uh, and related factors. And um, we found we, one of the questions we were interested in is, is this just a matter, is this true across the board in chemistry? Is this a field specific? issue, or is this a Berkeley chemistry thing? What we found is the, the results we saw in chemistry at Berkeley are particular to Berkeley. They're not particular to chemistry when we look across institutions. 
Um, we found some of the same differences for women and minorities, and particularly pronounced for African Americans across the board across these institutions. Our analysis, was, we used path modeling to do our analysis, and I'm not going to go into this to the, all of the um, methodology and all the results are in the paper. I, I don't, uh, obviously don't have time to go into detail about it, but I just wanted to say that's how we did our analysis. And we discovered that there's a relationship between student distress, graduate student distress, and publication. So outcomes of graduate education are related to student distress. And that what, we, what we found that, you know, really we found to be very useful is that distress can be mitigated it can be mitigated by clear articulation of clear standards for performance at the departmental level and clear expectations. And um, so that, you know, got us asking, well, do we see differences in clarity of expectations and performance, clarity of performance standards by field, by department? And this is where our work has taken us. We're still trying to sort that out. We, preliminarily have conducted interviews um, across departments and we have started to look at handbooks, advising, orientations, things like that, to try to see if we can distinguish between the way expectations and standards are communicated to students department by department. And I can tell you that already we have started to see some of that. We're, we think that this is a productive line of, of continued inquiry, in part because it's also suggested by other studies we know, and we 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 know from other studies that ambiguity is um, the context in which prejudice and bias often are expressed, um, and and gain gain expression. That unclear expectations and an ambiguous judgments are very commonly part of the um, process of conducting graduate education. There's ambiguity and um, this ambiguity and sort of open open processes to bias um, all along the way in terms of how ideas are judged, how met, which methods are considered valid, um, how which findings are considered important, how one writes up one's research and for what kind of audiences, so on and so forth. And I think um, I, I can hear the uh, echo of some of the things that Khalid has said, even as I hear myself speak here. Um, our preliminary kind of diagno diagnosis here is that um, we think all, benef all students probably benefit from an appropriate balance of consistent structure um, and from signals of support and belonging, and that disproportionately students from minoritized groups are likely to, um, to benefit from that. The interesting thing is consistent creating consistent structures in graduate programs is very cost effective. It doesn't cost very much. Um, the the difficult and sort of um, the the difficult and um, um, precious commodity that is required for it, however, is faculty time. It's faculty time. Um, we've started to talk uh, about this research in ways that suggest that we need in graduate programs to go beyond bias training in order to achieve equitable and just and fair and equal outcomes for graduate students and in order to finally address this issue of advancement to the postdoc and, um, and faculty level and ensure equitable access to those levels. We're now doing some qualitative research to try to identify what the key elements of structure are that might make a difference. We're working collaboratively with the University of Washington and like the University of Michigan in this. We're hoping to eventually publish a standardized measure for departments to use in assessing their own culture, how much of a sense of belonging there is among their students, and, and, um, and also their structure, how, how consistent their structural elements are. Um, and in the meantime, we've also started something of a bit of a workaround with this. Uh, which we call the research exchange and I am going to stop because I think I'm out of time but I do want to say this is a collaboration across nine institutions where we basically try to gain visibility for students for minority students underrepresented students among their colleagues at these nine institutions um, visibility for them as scientists and visibility for their scientific work and we've already started to see that as we engage in these cross-institutional collaborations and as we um, uh, engage our 
our underrepresented students in this process of visiting other institutions, other like peer institutions, other peer departments, that they learn more about what the expectations are, they learn more about what the standards are, and they also gain visibility for their work in, in ways that help them advance. Um, I can talk much more about that if you would like to hear about it. It's, a, it's an intervention that we're doing um, alongside trying to address structural issues within graduate programs. It's a bit of a workaround. It's, we call it sort of a hack because we're kind of hacking the old boy network, uh, infusing students of color into a process that usually goes something like this, you know, a faculty member calls someone he knows, usually he knows, from uh, in his field and says, hey, Joe, I've got this great student. You know, can I send them to you? I think you'd be really interested in them. Um, where basically we've designed a process where we, we, do, we do that same kind of thing, but we do it across these nine institutions that are peer, top peer institutions for underrepresented students with the, and anticipating that this will help students advance. And so far we've seen some really good results of that. It goes along with professional development and community building, of course, but that's, um, that's a, it's a comprehensive program. With that, I'd like to say thank you for bearing with me in this talk, and I'm, of course, open to questions and further discussion. Wow, I really um, thank you both for the most interesting and engaging talk, and I'm specifically delighted because some people know I had been 21 years at UC Berkeley, and some of this work now you can use has started there. So my heart is specifically happy. But first, Khalid, do you have something to say um, to the Colette specifically, or Colette to Khalid's uh, talk? We are very good in time. I'm, I, I feel like we, we spoke to really complimentary and overlap having things, so I'm super happy to let us move forward into a broader Q&A, so. Colette, that's the same? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. And I do want to, before we do that, I do want to um, uh, underline or highlight or emphasize or amplify something that you said, Marisi, which is that uh, many years ago, um, Marisi, in fact, was the research analyst, the top researcher at Berkeley in our graduate division, who started this entire line of, of thinking and research. And I have to say, I feel very grateful for the opportunity to really be standing on Marisi's shoulders in, um, have, in the work that we do, none of which really would have been possible without Marisi's insistence on um, this general line of inquiry um, that really started in uh, under her, um, you know, under under her at the time that she was at Berkeley. So I, I want to amplify that. It's a that you were very modest in the way that you said that, but you really are kind of the generator of this line of research, and um, we're grateful to you. Well, and we have to thank Joe Cerny, who actually was for many years the chair in the chemistry department and then became graduate dean and together with him we started that. So there are more shoulders to tie on. I pass it back to Margaret Heisel and she and, and asking questions and then we have all the many questions also from the audience. Thank you Marisi and thank you so much Colette and Khalid. Wonderful, terrific. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, but I wondered first, George, do you have any questions you'd like to raise? You're a scientist and I'm a humanities person. <laughs> well, I, I'll pass for now. I'd like to hear your questions first. Well, one of the issues that I've been thinking about when you think about power levers in this area is the resources for funding. And if, when you look at uh, how the federal government has been the major funder of uh, research in engineering. And if you look at where that support has gone, it has gone to an extraordinary degree to the most, those institutions that are, those research universities that are considered most prestigious. So I'm, I didn't know about that alliance that you just talked about, Colette, but that seems like one of the ways that 
it's very important that in those institutions we advance the kinds of efforts that you're doing. But one other thing concerns me, and that is that, as we all know, uh, public funding seems to be receding a bit in the last few years, and private funding is increasing. And I'm wondering, in this environment, how is this, how should we address this issue? In one in which I believe private funding for higher education is going to be of increasing importance. What are the implications for social justice in that environment? Colette, Khalid? Yeah, so I'll dive in here uh, first and then maybe Khalid will have uh, um, something to say about it too, I bet he will. So, um, you know, we see that whenever resources become constrained, uh, competition for them increases. And um, I think that that's, you know, we, we see that over and over uh, at every level. The more constrained the resources, the more competition there is. And the greater the competition, the more likely people are to fall back on the comfortable assumptions and biases um, that, that, you know, um, that they have without carefully thinking through the implications of um, those biases. And so it is very, the issue that you're raising, Margaret, is really concerning. Um, uh, we need to really address that in terms of um, querying, you know, how the, particularly in terms of admissions, um, in terms of faculty searches, postdoc searches and so on, how the methods people are using to determine promise, um, the, that those methods are fair and that they're uh, that they're consistently applied, that they're com consistently applied across applicants, across groups, and across time, right? So that's part of it is, um, is really, and I think some of the implicit bias work that we've seen, the research on implicit bias has suggested this, the institution of, or instituting um, uh, kind of thoughtful, predetermined processes for selection and, um, and, and structured, um, um, communications so that what so that everybody is is basically getting a fair shake. Um, when we have constrained public resources, it's more important than ever that those resources be fairly allocated and that opportunities that arise from those resources accrue equally across groups. It's even more important, right? So um, that matters a great deal. I will say that in the private sector, that there's a, um, there's a push and pull between the public and private sector in this regard, that the private sector sometimes is uh, behind us, you know, they're not as far ahead as we are in terms of dealing with uh, issues um, related to equity and social justice. And sometimes the profit motivation actually puts them ahead of us. So, um, when they, you know, as the demographics of the country change, um, there are times where the private sector um, sees the importance of reflecting in their scientific staff, in their scientific um, community, people who can properly respond to a more, um, a more diverse community. I'm, I'm uh, so I'm not ready to, you know, say that it's all good or all bad in either direction. Um, I'm not ready to cast judgment quite yet, but I do want to say that the public, re we need to be really vigilant about the use of public resources in this regard. I want to uh, sort of take a, and I, I totally agree with, with what Colette just said, and I want to sort of also frame this in terms of, I mean, as we're at a public university, I think this is one of the broader challenges facing public higher education right now is the state defunding. And I, I think that the long game here is one that leads to, in my opinion, greater inequity and less justice if we continue that process. Uh, private sectors funding research in order to gain material output from it for themselves. And I worry about that structural motivation. 
Um, Chris Newfield lays it out really well in his book, The Great Mistake, about how we've sort of allowed public universities to be defunded and increasingly they serve private interests. And I'm a little concerned about that form of privatization of public higher education. Um, and I think the onus is on us as academics within STEM to make the case for the public value of our work. And if our work doesn't engage with social justice, then why would the state want to fund us if we're only supporting private interests? And so I think there's like a chicken and egg there. And I think given the moment we're in now, it's on us to make the case that our work has public value and benefits the public in that sort of, you know, attempt at an egalitarian approach, one of the sort of starts of public higher education. And then to be able to go to the state and say, we've cleaned up our own the house we're doing work that serves the public interest you should fund this and i think that's the sort of approach that we need to take i think we it's hard to go to states now and ask for more money when they're like well how are you serving our interests and i think we need to make sure that what we're doing does serve the interests of the public and all of the public in that way um i wanted to if i could just jump in and add one more one more comment here um to just add a little more nuance to this which is that i think that um one one issue that concerns me a lot is that the um, retreat from public funding of higher education is um, correlated with or, or uh, aligns with the demographic changes that we see in our country. And we also know that there is an inequitable distribution of wealth with, within demographic groups in our country. And so um, I mean, not to um, overstate the case here, but I, I think, and this is really not my field, this is, the, the, this is for the economists to tell us, but I just wonder how much that disinvestment, that process of disinvestment in public higher education and in the public sphere has to do with wealthier segments of the country, not so much wanting to advance the um, education and careers of this new demographic majority. And that's of major concern and, and something that I think we all need to think a lot about how to push back on as in some of the ways Khalid described and, um, and also by um, ensuring that um, there is equitable access to the highest levels of academia so that there are people from all communities who can speak to across the board within their own communities about the importance of science and investment in public science, in, in, in the public sphere in science, and also can kind of talk, if you would like, truth to power in, in terms of um, the importance of investment in public higher education. Marisi? Um, I have a couple of uh, questions from the audience that maybe we can address. Uh, one of them is uh, concerning to our current context. So one of uh, our speakers, uh, I think was Michael, asked how the, has the, connecti the, connect the connection with the community partners has affected the implementation of your course, uh, Khalid in particular, during this time? And I add, adding to that question is, how we embrace the this pandemia the um, the context of this pandemia in the when we are uh, interacting with our graduate students and if you have any tips this is one of the um, the questions what was that, that, we that have. How, do, how do we embrace what was that how do we embrace this what, what i'm i am thinking when i say, i say the pandemia i am thinking in the implications uh, the limit, the, well, the most obvious one right now is the social distancing. But at the same time, is when we think for the future, right, about the question that we have to be raising. It's, that's a, that's a really interesting and I think important question. Um, the timing was, uh, if, if it's going to happen, it was about as fortunate as it could be for us in terms of engaging with community partners because the students working on these projects had already met and develop social bonds with the partners. And that kept 
is keeping them invested in the projects and keeping them interested because suddenly they're not just doing this technical thing around stormwater in Richmond, California. Now they're doing something with people that other people are connected to and it's made the work more meaningful and I think it's enabled them to sort of keep their head in the game as we're living socially distant and online and I think that's really important. Um, I, I, I think this it's I, I sort of wish I had developed a or if I'd known in advance, I'm sure we all say this, I had developed a bunch of research questions around this before the semester started and then after the pandemic we'd have seen how this played out but um, uh, you know, it, it's the ways in which the social connection plays such a role in motivating the work and, uh, and, and it sort of speaks a little bit to what's driving students and I think for myself as well, I find it very hard to teach online with that lack of social connection. Um, so I think that, that, that in this moment the transition has been hard, the projects have kept going. Uh, and it's being being maintained off of the momentum of previous relationships that keep it going right now. So, and I think it's it's hard to understate. We've done a, a study that the, that's under review right now, the paper looking at the effects of incorporating community partnerships in uh, engineering education, and it's been totally transformative for students. It's really enabled them to to both see the kinds of work they want to do. But it's also enabled them, which was interesting, to see themselves as engineers, which was something new that they, many of them were like, should I be doing this? It, this doesn't speak to what I'm interested in. And now they see how, oh, wait, I, I actually can do social justice work in engineering and I can see how that's possible. Uh, do you want to add anything, Colette? Um, how does the current context affect you? in the planning, in the conversation with the institution. Um, I, I am thinking in the, in the most technical component, like the access to technology, but also thinking for what, what we have to be elaborating. What are the type of conversation that we need to be um, generating at this time with, with the leaders? Yeah, you know, that's such a, big and important question. I think we're only just starting to figure out some of the answers to it as this is so new. Um, you know, in a lot of our work, I think the social aspect, um, creating community and a sense of community is really important, especially for students from, um, you know, and faculty just in general from uh, people in the academic community from minoritized groups who otherwise feel themselves and often you know, experience the, um, have the experience of being outsiders. And so much of what we do is bringing people together in community and that becomes harder when you have social distancing, especially when you're trying to bring people who are in relatively isolated where they are into a larger community across, you know, geographic space, right? Which is something we do, for example, in our California Alliance retreat. So it's a, it's a real question how we're going to do that. Um, I think, so this, that's just at a practical level, how to bring people together in this context where technology helps to some degree, but not the way in person does. Um, so there's that. Um, I think, you know, one, one thing that is becoming just patently clear is that the issues that we have been trying to address about um, the advancement of um, people from all groups in science is how utter that, that we can't even, this has magnified the importance of that work enormously, where we see that, um, you know, ensuring that people deeply embedded in every community understand science, um, can translate complex things like, I mean, we've seen an explosion of, um, you know, images having to do with exponents and, you know, logarithms. And um, I mean, we've never seen such complex math so suddenly visible and every social media on every kind of platform. Um, and it's really important that within every community there is a robust sub-community of people who are, um, you know, who are scientists and that communities feel themselves attached to science and um, and, and have access to science and feel that they know enough science and know enough about science to understand the implications of what's happening. 
this is, I, I, I mean, if anything has magnified the importance of this work, um, this pandemic has. And that I know that that's certainly true in the United States. I'm very curious about people's reflections on that in other parts of the world. Um, really don't want to make any assumptions, but in the United States, I think that's it's very, very clear. I, I also think that if we had deeper understanding of science, more equitably distributed and scientists more reflective of our, um, of all communities in this country that we would have, um, we would be able to present a much stronger challenge to the idea of alternative facts and the fabrication of truth. So that's, um, you know, which is something that is really, um, you know, is a, is a, has become a very, very serious danger to our democracy. Yeah, alternative facts. I have another question for Khalid uh, here from Sandra Larson. Sandra says, you mentioned that the course was particularly well received by students from marginalized groups. What evaluation data are you gathering about whether and how the course changes student mindset, mindsets? In particular, do you have any evidence that is changing the mindsets of overrepresented students, such as men, white students? We have, we, we have some survey data uh, from a couple years of study that we've done around the course as well as some focus group data. Um, the challenge that we have is um, selection bias with, with that particular group with overrepresented students. Folks who sign up for this course come into this for a reason because they're already interested in this when they come and so that's proven to be a bit of a challenge um, in interpreting the sort of Dream is a longitudinal study, you know, of all Berkeley undergraduate engineering students. Um, maybe one day in the works, um, but uh, but we don't have a lot of data to to understand what's going on. We have anecdotal data, and that that it helps people see pathways to do this, um, but not any sort of statistically. We're not coming up with big numbers because of the sample size issue that we have as well. Uh, thank you. I am not um, identifying any additional questions, so I would invite all of you, if you have any comment or um, suggestion or provocation that you want to share with us. I have one. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I have a, um, a good bit of background in international education, and the Czech article talks about culture, about seeing uh, engineering within culture. And I feel that we don't do enough as much as we should uh, in education, in higher education, of emphasizing knowledge of culture and how it impacts a discipline. And I have seen a number of uh, efforts at certain universities to help students see their discipline within cultural context. One of those is the University of Rhode Island's uh, engineering program, international engineering program, which requires that students spend a year abroad learning the language of that country and working in an internship, uh, an engineering internship there, where they really come to see how all the definition of being an engineer, of success in engineering, of goals of engineering, are redefined within a different culture. And uh, that's just, <laughs> it's, it's an idea that I, I really have seen implemented with great success. I don't know if uh, anyone currently watching has, has any contribution to make to that or comment on that, but I feel that, that that's a way of understanding cultural impact of a discipline is very effective. I, I wanted to say something to this, and I talked actually yesterday in another talk about it. It's what I call this country, where country now have flagship doctoral programs, those who are very well funded, like in the US by the National Science Foundation, the National Research Training Network, 
or in Germany, the graduate schools, or in the European Union, the uh, international training networks, uh, part of Marie Curie, they all, or in Australia, you have similar, the CRC. These are very well-funded doctoral programs, but they are few, but they are, and these have extra money and require also an international engagement, often an internship or some where the whole group moves together to another country and investigates. And I remember um, an evaluation we have done here at the University of Washington with search of one of these programs. It was in urban ecology. And it started out in the University of Washington and for several disciplines, planning, geography, landscape, architecture, forestry. And then these people moved, we tied them up in Germany in the Free University in Berlin to meet there. And the American doctoral students were surprised how historically city planning is approached. And then there's, but then there was still kind of the, the, the competition. Oh yes, um, you know, the American are nice, but they talk well and we German are more in depth and so on. And we as evaluator and research evaluating were kind of laughing, but they already started seeing difference. Then they moved as a group together to Krakow and then later to Mexico City. And suddenly they were both on the same grounds they saw different cultures and they were open to receive the different cultures and different approach to, in that case, city planning. It was really marvelous. And now I'm concerned if we, if we consider, you know, we need to stay more locally bound and also not having such a footprint and flying around, how can we accomplish that cultural? That's for me something in the last few days, I was thinking very much about my contribution. <laughs> One other item I'll, I'll mention uh, since, and that is that one of the illustrations, one of the reasons I think that in science and engineering, uh, that the depoliticization uh, element is so strong, uh, is that a lot of the research is what we consider basic research. In other words, just understanding nature, under taking the world apart. But one of the factors that students should be acquainted with is that even in the most basic research, there are social, very frequently social implications as you go along. The often basic research yields some very important products that have social implications. Ones that I uh, were given to me by uh, a colleague include things like transistors and light emitting diodes, fiber optics, all of these very practical applications came out of basic research. And I think that if students were made aware of that early on in their research work, that they would regard the social implications of their research differently. That's my last one. <laughs> I can't hear you, Marisi. Marisi? Do, do Colette or Colette have any response to what um, Margaret just posed? The social implications of basic research. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is anecdotal and um, the plural of anecdote is not data, so I just want to caution. <laughs> <laughs> this is just observation. Um, uh, in my experience working with students from minoritized and marginalized communities over time, um, students t tend to be very deeply rooted in their communities and are very much aware of the ways in which scientific invention and innovation can have an impact at a community level. I would say that it is not at all uncommon, it's more common than not, that in applying to graduate school, in their work in graduate school, um, the students 
that there that students um, I would say this is this is actually not uncommon in general across students, but particularly common for students from underrepresented groups are acutely aware of how their scientific education can translate into benefit to um, to can translate into benefit that can shift um, uh, you know the economy of communities, the resources available to them, and the um, quality of life in their communities. And um, I think that that's something that we, we see over and over. We often reflect on the fact that minority students really, you know, consider it important to give back to their communities in different uh -huh. ways, including with their, their scientific um, knowledge. Um, I think that the way the National Science Foundation has in, introduced the idea of broader impacts over the last decade or so into as a requirement, as a co-equal requirement with intellectual merit in um, gaining funding it has been really important. And I really applaud that. And I, 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 although I know that some scientists just brush through that and it's lip service, I think for those for those for whom that opportunity is really important, that um, criterion becomes uh, really um, gives them an opportunity to really dive in and think about how their work can be applied, can be extended to other fields, can um, translate, be translated through translational research and to make those connections. So I think that, uh, and again, this is, um, you know, I'm, I'm, this is a way in which we, the scientific community can structure in um, notions of broader impact, increasing participation, um, the usefulness of sci science, science, the um, applicability of even basic science or the promise of even basic scientific discovery to um, applied fields and, and, and sort of provoking and stimulating scientists to think about that. When I talk to students, and I do this pretty regularly, I give workshops on applying for the National Science Foundation's Graduate Research Fellowship um, Program and applying for other kinds of fellowships through the National Science Foundation and grant writing. I always pose a question to them of, you know, the, the um, taxpayers of the United States are gonna be paying for this research. They're gonna be paying your salary and that means that people all over this country in all kinds of jobs, you know, um, from white collar workers to blue collar workers, pink collar workers, um, people, you know, in every line of work are going to be paying for this science. What the National Science Foundation and Congress is asking you to do is explain why it matters to that taxpayer to do this. Why should they be giving you their money? Why? Why? What are they getting back from what you do? And even if the, and that's a really legitimate question and you answer that question through the broader impacts criterion. And so I think that structuring in the question for scientists to ask when they are applying for funding, when they are applying for jobs, when they're applying for admission to graduate programs is really important. Keeping it as a, as a provocative question always on the table for scientists to think about. I don't know if that answered your question at all, but Hopefully. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Very well. Exactly what I was hoping for. Thank you. I would add to that, even in the very narrow sense of doctoral training, asking them to give a five minute, what we call elevator speech, to explain to um, a smart audience, but not an audience which is in the field or anything, to explain why it matters what they're doing. And also for mathematicians, I do this often also in workshops around the world. And I found mathematicians have it particularly hard to answer why it is. So Colette, the work you're doing is wonderful. We have several questions in our chat, but I must say that I'm a little bit worried because of the time. We can continue, you know, moving forward, but um, for those that I know, there are several of you uh, um, have told me 
for in, internal messages that they have to run away. So feel free, it's 8 p.m. in South Africa. So we know in different time zones, um, oh, we have other obligations to attend. Uh, but there are a couple of interesting, um, very important uh, questions here. And one is one from Qinghua, from China. And he's asking uh, whether, the, whether the, the criteria uh, for publications are explicitly expressed uh, for all PhD students and if it does have a specific effect in the structure of the uh, of the program and the culture. For any of you, Khalid and Colette? So I'll just grab that quickly and say um, there's no one answer to that question unfortunately and that's part of the problem is that, um, you know, really consistency in answering that question would go a long way to establishing standards and expectations. Um, in general, there are some kinds of field differences and then different departments at different institutions will answer that question differently. Different advisors will answer that question differently. Um, so there isn't consistency around that. And consistency, if anything, is what our research is showing is helpful in producing equitable outcomes. So at least consistency within a department or consistency within a discipline. I would say that if I were to give sort of a, um, um, like an average, you know, answer here, which is hard to do. And, you know, there are lots and lots of, this will be wrong in lots of directions. It would be that students are usually um, expected to have what might constitute in most scientific fields roughly three publishable papers. Okay, one of the issues that we see coming up in chemistry, for example, is that in their pre qualifying exam, um, in the forms established to for that, that the advisors need to fill out for students um, as they set up their pre qualifying exams, the advisors are asked explicitly when do you expect the student to publish? Now, that we haven't seen anything like that in mathematics or physics or any of those other fields where we see the disparities in outcomes. And we think that actually just putting that question into the advisor's mind as a student enters their qualifying exam is, a, is helpful in seeing these equitable outcomes because this is no longer a question left up to the advisor should the student publish, shouldn't they? Is that a criterion? Is it in my group, in this group, et cetera? There isn't this huge variation that's permissible when every advisor needs to answer the question in order to complete the form to set up their student's <laughs> qualifying exam that when is the student going to publish? So that's, a, that's a, as best as I can do, I think, with trying to address the question Ali, do you want to say something to that question? I have another I think, one. For I, think, I think Colette handled it pretty well there. I, I, the one piece I would add is that I would love to see a greater emphasis um, in this process around uh, teaching and mentorship of students. Like I think those are two things that often get left out in this publish, 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 which by the way, I stole from Colette. So um, that like, I think that that enlargening a sense of like what we do, we're not just machines for producing publications, but that we do a lot more than that. And we need to value that. And I think by not valuing that we're structurally valuing certain people and not others. So that's a concern that I have. I also want to add here on the more global uh, <coughs> an aspect. I know in China, and I know also in South Africa, governments are meant well about the publishing, but give money back to the university for publications. And actually in, in South Africa, Roxana will know this best, also will give for every completed PhD money to the university. Now, when you give these kind of monetary incentive, part of it is good, it shall inspire, but it also has the other side that quality then starts to drop because just to comply, um, one published, and you know how now around the world, 
the number of journals is just multiplying. And there's so many, um, we say not high quality journals, but so you have our publications. So all of these things have two sides. So we need to really look also at the context. And that's why I think Colette's answer was just right. There is not one fixed answer. Besides, yeah. there is really a difference by disciplines. We in the social sciences, and I know in the humanities, we is very much say for us in some universities, and I know in Berkeley it was, it's still a book. You better write a book first. There is another very important point uh, raised by Richard that touches um, one of the things that we have been discussing. Uh, well, we, he says, what should we be communicating to leaders and those with authority and power? The work of Carita and Collect is excellent and they represent a small uh, potent center of actions on the Berkeley campus. Nevertheless, the institutionalized resistance to change among the professorate remains the biggest barrier. barrier. Are there activities making inroads into the larger students and professor population regarding social justice as relevant and essential issue? What percentage of engineering undergrads at Berkeley take Khalid's course? And how is Colette's work embraced or not by the department, schools, and the academic senate? Can we scale up these efforts? Several questions. <laughs> Ricky, um, you're, you're like asking me to step on a mine. Um, uh, like I, um, I think, uh, I think that scale is sometimes the enemy of good work. And I think we need to be careful about scale. There's sometimes a desire, let's make it a 500 person course and then put them all through this course. 500 people talking about power, race, marginalization is not the same thing as 60 people in a room having a conversation. And I think you can't have the same conversation which then means if we're talking about scaling it up, maybe we mean bringing in more people to teach more versions of similar courses. But that means hiring professors with different training and different focus. Um, hiring folks uh, with, and, and that requires valuing different training and valuing different sort of research focus uh, um, among faculty. That's sticky. FTEs are the currency in on campus, and asking to quote give up an FTE for something that's not you know research based publishing in in uh, high impact factor journals is something that faculty are very reticent to do. So this is the structural sort of loggerheads I think um, that that we face with this. Um, initially, this course before it came into existence was strongly resisted. There was some of the comments were really sort of eye-opening and taught me a lot about what's going on um, in sort of tenure track faculty cir circles. However, six years on, there's like a scramble to claim the course. And so I've, this transition is really fascinating to me that at one point we fight it, we see it's working, okay, now we want it and we want, we want more of it. And so, um, uh, I think that's a, an interesting and, and gives me optimism, I think, in, in many ways. Uh, but I am nervous about administrative priorities because this course, it, it causes some trouble, as you might imagine. We're asking structural questions. One of the questions that came in the chat when Marissa is about the graduate student strike, that was centered in our course this semester. That came up over and over. I have two graduate students in the course. Uh, we had guest speakers come and talk about what's happening. We held class outside on the picket line one day because it's hard to understand, you know, for students to understand not only these ideas of the, the, the politics rooted in science, technology, and engineering, but also to understand the structural conditions in the place where they're learning that helps them understand understand what are we learning and what aren't we learning in our classes and how did that come to be. I think that these are sticky issues. Um, and I, I, I'm not certain what to tell higher administrators. I think to the extent that faculty governance is still a thing, I think faculty's priorities are really at the heart of what needs to be addressed here. You want to add anything, Colette? So I have, I tried to jot down my thoughts really quickly in response to this question. I have so much to say, but I honestly, I could do an entire talk just on this topic. So I'm going to try to keep it pretty brief here. But 
I would say in response to the kind of work that we've done, for example, the research exchange, um, retreats where we invite faculty to the community of this California Alliance and now more broadly includes Berkeley, Caltech, Stanford, UCLA, Harvard, um, University of Texas at Austin, University of Washington, um, Georgia Tech, and who am I leaving out? Um, uh, okay, I'm, my inventory is, you know, not right there, but, and, and another institution, which we'll, I will remember in a minute. But um, as, we, as we bring these institutions together and people from these institutions, so graduate students from minority groups, uh, postdocs and, and faculty more broadly, we see really the faculty response has been unbelievably positive. I mean, unbelievably positive. We invite, so we do this carefully, right? We've designed a program, it's not ad hoc. We have a colleague invite one of their colleagues to host a visiting student. And that handoff, that you know, secret handshake, just like it works in the old boys network, it works for this network. And that's exactly how we've designed it to work. And it does. I think we've had out of close to 100 participants in this program, we've had one student not be taken up. One. It's, I mean, faculty are really excited to do this. And when we invite faculty to across institutions, um, I should say that when, when we invite faculty to retreats, it's an extraordinary thing because the faculty see a collective group of students from minority groups, from peer institutions, all students who have the same extraordinarily high aspirations, have incredib are incredibly well positioned to advance, are you know, exemplary students in every regard. And it's a, it's a stereotype smashing experience like right there. And that is, has been incredibly helpful and because most faculty see one student of color, two students of color, they may never ever have a colleague from a minority group. And they may never have been in a class with a colleague from a minority group through all of their years of education. And to be in a room where they are the, if they're majority, you know, white, Asian, to be in a, in a room where they are the minority and the intellectual caliber is over the top extraordinary, is, is a, it's a, it, you cannot hold on to a stereotype under those conditions, you just can't. Um, and so that has really been a game changer and an attitude changer with faculty. And for this reason, when we hold these events, we, we rotate them between participating institutions so that in fact we can um, invite faculty from all these different institutions to become part of and value the community. So we've had great results there. I do want to say that, you know, so the optics are really important here. I do want to say that the, um, the, the cross-institutional collaboration and scaling up is crucial to our work. This is not something that benefits from small scale at all. We're really trying to, the, the institutions that we're working with, these top tier, large research universities, private and public, are the institutions that produce the nation's professoriate here across the board. But, and most importantly, it's the, there's been some research on this. This is, and I'm happy to share the paper on this, but mo these institutions within a closed circle trade personnel, for want of a different way to put it. So it's almost, it's very, very difficult to get a faculty job at a place like Harvard if you weren't doing a postdoc at a place like Berkeley or Michigan. And so ensuring that there's cross-institutional collaboration across, we are working with the top nine, but we would really like to go to the top 25 institutions Create, creating visibility for this, you know, truly outstanding by any measure group of minority scientists, creating visibility for them as a prospective pool for hiring within this tier is really like that is we really, it's really uh, important to go to scale. And that is in fact our mission and every 
Um, every piece of work we're doing right now is focused on taking this from nine, you know, we went from four institutions recently to nine. We're now advancing to scale at, at 25. That's our next step. Um, and then how this might be replicated within other institutional tiers is kind of the next question or other groups or networks of institutions, but scale matters a great deal. Thank you so much for um, those um, ideas. Um, you, you all have uh, made me to think quite a lot about the roles that we play, uh, especially when we're starting our academic career and the walls that we have to break, perhaps not break at the very beginning, just make enough holes to start communicating and creating collaboration. So uh, having said that, um, I just want to to uh, invite you all for our next event that will happen and will take place in the south part of the African continent. Um, and let's make this a space to bigger and bigger and embrace um, new voices to, to this conversation. Margaret, Marisi, Gemma, um, Helena, do you want to say anything? I want to just thank really you. thank you, everyone. This was very inspiring. And I'm thanking our audience far away and close by. And I hope you as much enjoyed it and got ideas. That's the main thing. How to move forward. And as Colette and Khalid said, scale up. You know, there is, makes a difference. And we get more people committed to social justice.